giving you a voice and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to the Best of the West Shallow Dive, where we take a peek under the hood of some incredible teams in the Best of the West region. This is your opportunity to see how teams work, check out their robots in greater detail, and ask questions so you can help improve your team. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Grace Rosenball. And I'm Alex Utzinger. Now then, let's welcome our guests for this evening. This team went undefeated this season, and yes, unlike many others claiming this title, they actually played in 16 matches to do so. They are the winners of the Los Angeles Regional, they were inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2016, and are one of the top teams in first. Please welcome Team 987, the High Rollers. Our guests for this show are former drive coach, Steven, and lead of the design team, Ricky. Welcome all, and thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Now before we get started, it looks like we have a giveaway tonight from Andy Mark. Tyler, can you tell us more about this fantastic giveaway? Yeah, uh, more importantly, I need to ask Steven, he's not, you're not the drive coach anymore? Oh, no, I, yeah, this is the first year that I didn't do it. Oh. Yeah, we have a new drive coach this year, yeah. <laughs> Dennis Jenks actually took over for All me. All right, for sure. So my my mistake on that, but we'll miss you out on the field, no doubt. So, uh, all right, so we do have a giveaway from our friends at Annie Mark, who are giving away, guys, it's the GOAT. The GOAT is up for grabs in this segment, and everybody likes the Annie Mark GOAT. We even have an emote that's not exactly like it because we definitely wouldn't rip off Annie Mark by any means. But uh, So, once again, if you're interested in winning this, we'll have a keyword. Uh, it's not even in stock right now, by the way. Um, apparently, according to Andy Baker, if you read on this, it says the GOAT is our McRib. So, it's only during certain times. But guess what? They have a few set aside for us. Uh, but just a reminder, like all suppliers, things are currently delayed right now. People are out of shops as they're working from home. But we'll have a keyword for you to type in later on during the show. That's your opportunity to win. Don't forget to make sure you click that follow button in order to be eligible and subs get 5 x lux. We'll give it away later on during the show. All right. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, moving over to 987. Just to start off, what was your game plan immediately after kickoff? Um, what did your initial strategy robot design look like uh, after you saw the video read through the manual? So we were really surprised by this game. It had a lot like ball shooting and climbing. Uh, as soon as we uh, saw the game, we focused on how many balls can we hold and how fast could we shoot. We saw that we could hold five balls. So we knew we couldn't have some we could have something like 2017. But we also decided to mix the shooter with a 2016 and a 2017. So then because we realized there's three stages and at least 40 balls to shoot. So we needed to finish the stages as fast as we could. And that's how we came up with our design. And we started to split up into groups and start assembling stuff. Awesome. Uh, what do you, so you came up with an initial design. What does the timeline of kickoff look like from, you know, you know, when you're sitting down with your team watching the live stream to having that initial design and breaking up into groups? So we so, changed it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Right. I was going to say we changed it a little bit from what we've done in years past where, like, day one, we... Well, we say that, but we still were shooting balls day one, like using old robots and stuff. But we tried to get away from that because we felt like designing something or going off of something day one kind of pigeonholed us into a certain design. So we spent most of like kickoff day going over the rules and trying to figure out like any crazy strategies or anything like that. And we were like surprised this game was like, I don't know relatively simple. Like it wasn't like where there was any gotchas in years past. Like we went through the rules and figured out that. Yeah, we just need to build a robot, basically, that gets as many balls in the goal as possible, uh, you know, quantity, not quality. And, um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, with the other, you know, fun side stuff, like spinning the wheel, hanging, all that fun stuff. Yeah. That being said, so I know that, you know, build seasons start off comp uh, simple, but they often get complicated. So what were some of the challenges that you guys faced specifically this year during the build season? You think I could answer that? Uh, yeah, go for it. Um, 
So we, the definite big thing that we found out is that obviously there's no bag day, so we had more time to design and complete and utilize everything for the shooter and the entire robot. Uh, we actually had a lot of problems with our shooter. We wanted to make it as perfect as we, as we can. We finally got it down, and it worked out well. And we also wanted to be as fast as we can on the climb. So we wanted to, most of that went during the build season as well. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned that you pulled out old robots, and I know that's something several teams do. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about which robots you pulled inspiration from, either from your own team or even others? And how did that shape the design of this year's bot? So we definitely did get some inspiration from 2012, but we also looked at our 2016 robot because we realized there was the trench and we could either be a tall robot or a short robot. So we wanted to copy the same thing that we did in 2016, being a short robot and being fast at shooting. But we also needed something that could be as consistent as our 2012 robot. So we tested out those two shooters from our 2012 and our 2016. And once we figured out that we could actually utilize both into one shooter, that's what we went for instead. Yeah, I would agree on those robots. 2012 was a big driving force. Um, one of the things I guess is a little bit different about a robot. I, I mean, I didn't get to see enough of them to know, but we didn't you do use the traditional like hooded shooter design that we've kind of done in years past. It's, it was a lot like 2016s um, because the programmers really wanted that pan and tilt. Actually, the inspiration for it was actually 2013. That year, we kind of had a robot where it could stop on a dime and just shoot from kind of anywhere because it just it had, was on a turret, it had pan and tilt, so you could just stop and shoot. That's what we were going for. And uh, it did pretty well at that, I would say, in our first regional. Wow. Oh, um, so over the course of build season, especially with no bag, you have a lot of time to prototype, change thing on, things on your robot. Uh, what sort of changes did you make over the build season as you saw other teams realize the challenge may be a little more complicated or less complicated than you thought? So we... We did uh, watch Robot in three days. We saw the different teams that used their climb and used their shooter. We wanted to stay the same as a low bot. We changed up our uh, shooter a lot over the time. And then while we were in build season, we saw that a lot of teams had the climb with the motorized wheel, which allowed them to shift around on the climb to balance out. We, were tr we decided not to do that to save our motor space and to put it into other things as well. Oh. Hello. Oh, looks like we got Chris. <laughs> looks like Chris got uh, it. Okay. Sorry, it took a little bit too long. Uh, too long for me to join in. Um, okay. I'll kind of talk about yeah. One of the big things that changed our design along the way is we kind of cheated on PDP ports as we were like prototyping and putting everything on the practice bot and realized pretty late that we had run out of motors like that we could not use all the motors that we had on there so we had to make some sacrifices we only used two motors on our drivetrain instead of the three that we wanted which is a pretty big sacrifice in my mind yeah. taking motors off the drivetrain but had to do what you have to do for your robot to be functional so yeah. that we wound up with one spare pdp port after removing two two motors off the drivetrain what kind of drivetrain did you guys run on the robot so um, Oh, yeah, go ahead, Ricky. Yeah. You did all so the designs. So. Yeah, so we used to actually do a tank drivetrain, uh, but after our 2018 year, we decided to try something else and try to West Coast drivetrain. It's worked out really well last year, so we decided to do it again this year. And we now went with three motor gearboxes to see how fast we can go and finish mm -hmm. the game. So, And it's worked out pretty well with us so far. Our gearboxes want to be geared for 20 feet per second actual on the field. And we were we were running two Falcon 500s per side. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Still a very powerful drivetrain. So, uh, Ricky, you were telling me that you uh, you were pretty heavily involved in the process of developing and designing the shooter. So, what were some of the the steps you took to do that? The iterations. How, what was the process like to to design that shooter? So, obviously, I had an idea of the shooter. The definite hard part was how much compression should a ball have while it's shooting out and then another thing is what type of wheel should we use and should we use like a inertia wheel etc we decided not to have an inertia wheel we decided to go with four inch colsons for the horizontal part and then the the flywheel was 
and Andy Mark wheel that worked out pretty well. And it was, it was a lot of iteration and it definitely took some nights out of me. <laughs> yeah. What were the, what was the reason that you decided to go, uh, to not go with a, uh, like a weighted shooter wheel? Uh, so we realized that if the, if there was a inertia wheel on our flywheel for the, this hybrid shooter that we had, it would shoot out too powerfully and, Sometimes the balls would bounce out of the scoring area instead of going in. So that's so, why we removed it instead. Yeah. Good problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we actually had a lot of issue with uh, us breaking the back of our goal. We were, we were breaking the 120 pounds <laughs> of ties that were holding the back of our goal together. Uh, we, we had an extremely powerful shot, but it was, uh, one, that was one of the major downsides of it. It was too powerful. I was going to ask you guys about the like the velocity, the exit velocity of these power cells. Yeah, is nuts. So did you guys did you end up tuning that down, or did you just just get it in the right spot and at the right velocity? Well, you end up make, tuning it down. You hit threes every time. You don't have to worry about the speed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was our goal. It didn't exactly end up that way. Yeah, we had a few bounce outs, but um, overall, I mean, it was pretty good. It was fun. We have. I guess I should have put the video in there for you guys to look at where I stood in front of it with a face shield on and got pelted by like six balls <laughs> it actually hurts those things come out pretty quick you wouldn't want to play dodgeball against this thing for sure <laughs> all right um well having i when we were talking before the show we were talking about how programming wanted the shooter to have certain functionality but there's still people driving the robot so what did the driver's training look like i know chris i think is a second year driver but this is still yeah. a different robot than last year to drive uh, this robot was incredibly fun to drive with an extremely low center of gravity. Uh, the closest robot I could compare it to was our 2013 robot, uh, If for those of you who have seen that. Uh, very low center of gravity. It was really, really easy, really uh, maneuverable around the field. Um, with the brushless drivetrain moving at 20 feet per second in high gear, it was extremely fast. You could get out of tight spots relatively quickly. It was actually really easy to um, get from one side of the field to the other from the loading station out to shoot. Uh, we had, we had around a seven second cycle time going from the loading station out of, all the way out to the, uh, the goal and, and shooting the power cells uh, into the two and three point goals. Dang. So as part of that, I know that you guys have some pretty sophisticated code development. So um, what was the process like and how did you integrate the, the driver like the driving subsystems with the software to automatically aim and do whatever whatever sort of automated tasks you ended up having on this year's robot? A lot of our tasks were manual. Uh, one of the really cool automatic uh, things that we had, uh, our turret would swing around, and uh, we, unfortunately we didn't really get to Im implement it. Uh, our turret would sw swing around, and the same camera that we used to track the goal, we would go into color mode for our limelight. We had a separate pipeline, and we would use the turret we would turn it backwards and we would look at the bottom of the color wheel. So the uh, going to the correct color was completely on, uh, automatic. We had our three rotations set completely automatic for the color wheel. So that entire subsystem was automatic. Uh, we had our climb sequence the, uh, to deploy our hook and our arm. We had a set height we could manually adjust from that. So the entire first three steps of our climb sequence were completely automatic. I guess what Chris is trying to say is we try is no offense to him as a driver. We try to take the driver out of it mm -hmm. as much as possible. And with that, how much adjusting the code to the driver versus adjust getting the driver adjusted to the code do you guys do? Have uh, you on the wanted... second one. Chris can comment a little better on that. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we wind up comment, uh, having the code complement the driver. It's uh, for the driver and the co-driver. We normally do a lot of changing around buttons, doing all this. We use these Thrustmaster joysticks. Uh, they have an insane amount of buttons on them. There's like 16 buttons just on the pad. Um, both both of our drivers, me and the, our co-driver, wound up having so, uh, so many buttons that were... Uh, we had one that was for climbing. We had one that was for the Wheel of Fortune. We had a wheel of fortune uh, deploy for both uh, three rotations as well as color selection. We had a uh, near, far, and super close shot for different power selections as well as crosshair offsets. So there was a lot of 
uh, different buttons for very specific scenarios. Mm. Wow. So you've been describing a lot of really complex software. I mean, trying to take the driver out of it as much as possible. So that takes a lot of work to develop. So how do you manage and make time for that as you're also trying to build a robot around the software? So um, uh, one thing that really helped us was having an eight week build season. That was one of the, the greater things. Uh, we had our prototype robot uh, as well as our practice robot up both simultaneously and we always had two robots up so while one of us was or while one team let's say our designer our mechanical team was working on changes to the robot we would have our programmers uh, the creator of limelight Brandon Hellstrom Brandon Hellstrom was working really closely with our uh, lead software engineer for uh, his name's Cameron he's only a, he's only a sophomore he's our lead programmer for the team so that it's wonderful to be able to see them work together. Uh, we have a couple more trainees that have been working. So we, we have quite a large programming team for having one robot. Awesome. Well, we're going to move on to talk a little bit more about competition, but I know there are still questions being accepted in chat. So you guys did actually get to compete this season. Uh, 987 is considered by some to be a, quote, honorary California team. So going out to the event outside of Nevada, were there anyone already on your radar that you wanted to play with? Uh, we were really excited to play with 4201. Uh, being a defending world champion, it was really amazing to be able to see their shop. They were the ones hosting the event. That was a, that was another really large upside, uh, being able to get to know 4201, getting to know Vitruvian. They were an amazing team. They were an amazing team to play with. Um, just going into California, there's a couple of teams that we like to look, we always are friends with. We're, we like to talk with them, talk back and forth. Uh, those are the Warlords and the Holy Cows. So a lot of the California teams are very familiar with them. 207 Metal Crafters, those guys won the World Championship. Well, no, they didn't win the World Championship with us. We were on Einstein with them in 2012. Great team, awesome guys. Uh, Hall of Fame team 597 was there too. We were excited to see them. Um, we yeah, also, I mean, the, yeah, we also got to see the Torbots 1197. We teamed up with them in 2016 as they were our first pick, and then uh, we saw them again on Einstein. We teamed up with them again. It was really nice. We did get to compete with against them in the finals. We didn't team up this time, but it was nice seeing them and getting to catch up with them. Ah. Uh. So going into the Los Angeles Regional then, how did you prepare for scouting? What kind of pre-scouting did you do? And what strategies did you develop going into the regional? So pre-scouting well, wise, uh, a couple of the teams had competed the week before at LA North since it was week two. Only a handful though, like three or four, not a lot of pre-scouting, I would say. What were you gonna talk about, Ricky? Go for it. So mainly for scouting, we definitely wanted to see who could climb and who had a consistent climb, because we knew the ranking points were very important. Uh, and another one was how many balls could they shoot really quickly within a certain amount of seconds, because we needed a team that could help us uh, finish the stages really quickly. Uh, we did want to aim for completion of three stages. We couldn't get there, but we were pretty close. Hmm. Okay, and then sort of going off of that um when you were preparing for alliance selections what qualities were you looking for and what did you think was a must-have for a butts you were looking to pick climb climb was a must-have climb yeah that was number <laughs> one right and then obviously ball scoring ability is a is a close second i mean you know one could outweigh the other but i mean the best mix of those two i would say is probably what we were looking for yeah we we often found that uh Having a wheel, wheel of fortune manipulator didn't come down to our final selection just because we wound up having uh, one of the only functioning wheel of fortune manipulators at the event. Uh, we had a, a lot of teams that we that we were looking for. We were actually looking for a really well, uh, good defense robot, which 6,000 filled that role extremely well. Awesome. All right. Well, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the selection discussion. I, My former team, 21-22, we had the honor of playing with you guys at 2017 Champs. And I remember sitting in on that scouting meeting, and you guys were talking over a little bit about the system you use for scouting, for ranking selections. Could you uh, kind of give our audience maybe a little bit of a, a peek inside of how you guys make your decisions, what that scouting process looks like? Sure. So there is a spreadsheet that they all use, and like we collect the data um it's hard to sustain we have a lot of scouts i wouldn't recommend it for like 
the average team. I will say it has been streamlined the last few years. We look at a whole lot less stuff. We used to have like a lot more scouts and a lot more data points and stuff on there. And truth be told, it's like, sort of unmanageable you collect way more data than you need so um i would say it's streamlined quite a bit since then but it's still i mean we still collect more data than we need (laughs) but it's kind of cool to go back and look at some of the correlations and fun stuff like that but we have i mean basically 12 full-time scouts in the stands so that we have one person on each robot and then they you know trade off to get breaks and stuff like that because scouting's grueling man like it is underappreciated for for sure still in first and uh I mean, you got to have good scouts. So it's the system is definitely simpler than what you saw in 2017, I would say. The kids can chime in a little bit. I know Ricky and Karis don't do much scouting because they're busy in the pit a lot. (laughs) But they've seen the spreadsheet, too. They could comment. But, like, what's nice about it is that you can change your weights. Like you said, we kind of didn't know. Even based on week one, we weren't sure if it was going to be a completely different game week two than it was week one. It wound up being pretty similar, but you never know. Like, the game evolves as the season goes on. And so, like, you may not be looking for the same things week two that you are week six and stuff like that. Or in a second bot, in a second pick, and a, th- and a first pick. So, I, I was actually a pre scout, or not a pit, uh, pit scout in 2017 and 2018. And there were often times that we had information on teams that the teams didn't even know about themselves. Like, we would come <laughs> up and we would say, hey, uh, you you only scored two gears this last match yesterday, and they were like, we uh, they they're, they're they would be oftentimes they didn't even remember the match we were talking about, uh, or they're like you you have a, you have a gear average of seven and a half. What's keeping that from being eight? And they, we had, we scored seven gears every match. No, <laughs> it would it, it's it's always really interesting to be able to see the information that we have on the teams. Yeah, I had the same role as Karis, but it was for this year. I managed my time as being a pit scout and also being in the pit. So whenever we had we had a match schedule, I would immediately go check on our alliances uh, for the next match and ask, hey, how is your guys' robot? Are you guys ready? We would always try to help out our alliances every time before our matches to make sure they're working well. And then obviously uh, for alliance selections, our second pick, we always try to find how's your robot, how are you doing, and we make sure to ask him some questions that some scouts wouldn't probably know just in case. Uh, so going into eliminations, it looked like uh, like your team 987 was an unstoppable force. Um, so how did eliminations go from your perspective? I think eliminations went extremely well. Uh, we had an amazing team to play with. It, uh, the bracket worked out really well into our favor. Favor. We got a lot of the te- we got the teams that we we would really hope to get. Uh, we played against some really really good teams. Uh, obviously, going undefeated was a really good uh, pro to have going through eliminations. Um, well, obviously the season is postponed, but there's still technically the Las Vegas Regional, and you had a champs qualification on the horizon, and possibly off-season events. Um, so what sort of changes do you want to make to your robot? What do you want to accomplish when things get back to normal? And what are you looking at for the rest of whatever this competition season turns out to be? So after LA Regional, we definitely wanted to fix up our climb. It wasn't as consistent as we expected it to be, so that's what we wanted to fix before the LVR regional. And we also wanted to fix our autonomous a little bit, so it would be close to a 10-ball auto instead of just being a 6-ball or an 8-ball auto. And fix our back half of our frame. We completely trashed our robot. Most people probably don't know that, but uh, we did it, too. Like, nobody else did it to us. I think we drove underneath the uh, trench uh, trench with our climber and just knocked the entire back half of our robot off. You can't really tell by watching it, but had to do some yeah. major surgery about five it was, uh, so. I think it was, it was quarterfinals two around the <laughs> 45 to 50 second mark. Uh, we're going underneath the, tw- the trench, and the flywheel spin-up button is right next to the climb deploy button. Used to be. So, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it used to be. Um, we, w- we wound up running our deploy climb sequence underneath the Wheel of Fortune. So that uh, um, com- compared with going full speed underneath that trench was uh, really devastating to the back half of our robot. The climber was actually okay, which was really surprising. <laughs> then um, reminiscing a little bit, back in 2016, the high rollers, uh, you guys won the chairman's award 
uh, or the championship chairman's award, putting you among few in the esteemed Hall of Fame. Um, do you guys still apply for chairman's post 2016? And what outreach do you still do in the Las Vegas community? So our team definitely understands that there are other teams that want to achieve the chairman's award. So we decided not to do go for the chairman's award anymore. But we still do keep our Hall of Fame uh, recognition, and we still do a lot of community outreach. We host FLL competitions. We help uh, help with FTC teams or VEX teams around the valley, and we help other FRC teams as well by hosting scrimmages at our facility and. With the thanks to Tesla, we actually got a full Andy Mark field that would help host other scrimmages for other teams around the valley. Yeah, and uh, potential future offseason. Yeah, there's uh, there's close to or upwards of twenty teams in the Las Vegas Valley where we host seven of them. Uh, easy every single weekend in our shop, we open up our doors. We have an open shop policy, so teams are allowed, are allowed to come in. We help them work on their robot. Uh, we help them prototype. We have we help them do all this. We have an, we have a very large fabrication shop, so we can help them make parts. We can help them make materials. Uh, we have we do robo camp every single year. So we do we reach out to our middle schools, our elementary schools, and we host them uh, at our school. We teach them the basics of uh, robotics using Vex IQ, Lego, uh, Vex EDR. We help them work through all of that. Uh, that way, by the time they get to middle school or high school, they are more competitive in robotics and uh, they're able to further the program at their school. Sadly, we have had to cancel our camp just because of the current situation. So that's kind of a big bummer. That camp also serves as a big fundraiser for our team. So it does kind of suck, but I mean, it sucks for everybody right now. So we got to do what we got to do to get through it. I will say we've talked about um, not maybe formally applying at a regional for the chairman's award, but we're now in 2020. Uh, We won in 2016, like you guys said, so, like, all of the kids on our team now at this point, like, no one was around when we won it, and no one, I don't want to say appreciates, but just no one really has experienced or understood the documentation process that that takes to apply for that award. Like, it is grueling. It's, that is the, the best thing about winning the, the Hall of Fame Chairman's Award, is that we still do probably 95, 98% of what we used to do, but you don't have to you know get all the photo ops and worry about all the documentation and stuff like that you know to toot your own horn you can just do it and it's nice it's a lot a lot less stressful so we've talked about like maybe like pseudo applying like collecting all that documentation and like but not actually applying at the regional Hmm. Uh, well thanks for sharing about that uh tyler i hear we have our giveaway ready yeah, let's go ahead and start the uh, giveaway once again for the Andy Mark Goat. Uh, and since, you know, uh, it's a Baker quote, so we got to go with that. How about McRib? That is the uh, keyword to win uh, this, this one. It's on the <laughs> website. That means it's okay, right? So uh, so McRib. Uh, I'm not sure if that means you're going to eat the goat or how, uh, never mind. All right. So once again, type in McRib. That's your opportunity to win. Don't forget our subs get five times chance to win. And by the way, if you're a subscriber and you help fund State Law Live and Independent, you do get access to a special channel or Discord where all of our giveaways that aren't claimed, and it does happen sometimes, Go to uh, our subs in there, uh, as well as you're helping us out uh, stay uh, stay alive and st- keep going, and so we keep making shows. So we definitely appreciate that. So once again, McRib is the keyword. We'll draw in just a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Tyler. Well, I wanted to ask one more question. Uh, this year, you guys also won the Industrial Design Award. So talk to us a little bit about what that award was given for um, and how you guys treat talking to judges about awards at competitions, especially for technical awards. So we got the industrial design award out. Our team was really proud of that. We uh, got it for our CAD work. We had a design book to share to our judges, and we talked about why we made each design of the robot and how it went down. Uh, in my opinion, I always go for making the robot as easy to, to uh, maintenance as possible in the pit because obviously there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and you want to fix it as soon as you can. So we told that to the judges, and they were very happy with that. And in my opinion, I think we had the most easy maintenance robot in the regional, uh, LA regional. And there was the other question. I forgot what it was. The last question. Um, yeah. Which one was it? Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so the question was, uh, I, I I remember this from being on the team. We talk a lot about like talking about chairmans and entrepreneurship, but how do you guys talk to judges for more like the technical award side of things? So uh, in the pit, uh, we always like to show off what our robot can do. Uh, this year and last year, we had, we had two really amazing design points to talk about. Uh, last year, we had our hatch slider. That was something that we could demonstrate in the pit using our, our vision tracking system. This year, the entire uh, top of our robot, our bed, our feed mechanism, our tutor, our turret, every, every, everything that besides the drivetrain, essentially, uh, was on a hinge, and we lifted up our entire robot. So you could get down to your electrical, you could get down to your pneumatics, you could get down to your subsystems, you could change out your drivetrain belts, you could change out your drivetrain gearboxes. Everything was really modular. If we wanted to bring an entire backup half of our robot, we could throw it into a trash bag and take it with us. Awesome. Yeah, it kind of looks like popping the hood on a dragster or something when you <laughs> when you pop that thing up. So the whole robot kind of just folds open in half. I guess we don't have any video of that. Uh, we're going to have a reveal video coming out pretty soon. I uh, should have, have some video of that. <laughs> For sure. Very cool. So it looks like um, it looks like we also got some questions from the audience um, from Poofy Jacket two fifty four. Uh, they're asking why did you guys decide on a winch elevator? I think that they're referring to the uh, the robot from last year. But oh yeah, the climber. Oh <laughs> yeah, why did so, you guys decide to use a winch elevator for the climber? Uh, we decided that we wanted to be able to climb on our center of mass. Uh, one of the really uh, big advantages of that is you go up level and then is uh, if you wanted to get a hook up there you can just you can deploy your hook you can have your rope dangling far away that's the same advantage of having a grappling hook you can get out of the way let someone else climb and then as soon as you're up uh, as soon as they're up you can go up right behind them uh, one of our triple climb matches we wound up sneaking in after everyone else had climbed we had just deployed our hook and then we brought down our arm and we only had to worry about raising up our robot we didn't have to worry about having this massive upper structure that would climb the only thing that we go on the bar uh, that goes on the bar is that hook and it's extremely low profile we can climb level with ourselves which is really amazing i would say the drawback of it is that as you guys can see in that video in our matches it was a little wobbly that's one of the things we were going to try to improve for the future is how can we because that does affect the balance at the end we had a couple matches where we didn't get the extra ranking point because we were still wobbling a bit I just want to follow up real quick on that. I think, you know, on paper, what a lot of people see this type of lift, they say, well, a big disadvantage is you only get one shot to do it. But the reality is, right, like you're not hanging with 30 seconds left necessarily. you got to design that. You're going to hang with just a few seconds left, right? Correct, yes. yeah. And, yeah. I mean, you do get – well, I mean, once the hook is deployed, you get one shot, yeah. But, I mean, if you miss, like we, we at least designed it so that you – it wasn't like the harpoon and – uh what was the, what year was that where if you missed uh, it you're kind of done yeah 2016 yeah so we didn't go quite that far i mean that would have been cool i guess too but we yeah. you if you missed you could still get another shot at it but yeah once your hook's up there that's that's where you're climbing so awesome uh do you guys have any final thoughts on this season on your robot pineapple on pizza that sort of thing that you want to share <laughs> with the audience it was unfortunate that the lvr was canceled but we're very proud of our robot this year we put a lot of work into it, and for Karis and I, it's our last year, but at least we got to work on a robot, you know, and to yeah. make it and compete with it, that's what we're really proud about. Yeah, we're super fortunate that we were one of the few teams that did get to compete this season, so we're super thankful for that. And, I mean, I really feel for a lot of the teams out there that did not get the chance to, but we and, like, me and Karis and Ricky were talking a little bit about it before the show. It's like, um, I mean, you know, what do you tell those teams? It's like... It's not worthless, you know what I mean? Like if you're if you're an underclassman, put that energy into next year. If you're a senior, put that energy into your future. Put it into college, work, mentoring, coming back. But it is just a sad situation no matter what. But we try to stay as positive as possible. Yeah. yeah. We did also have an amazing season this year. We went undefeated throughout our entire regional. We led the world in scoring for week two. We were the best scoring robot for that. Uh, mm -hmm. except climb climb points we did we did fall short but scoring cargo and spinning the wheel of fortune we did we, we did lead the wheel the world in scoring so arguably we had we, we had one of the best robots in the world this year uh it was it was amazing to be able to play it was an amazing game to play uh we do, we are talking about doing several of the off-season events if they do plan to continue and uh 
if Chessy Champs decides to be hosted, if IRI decides to be hosted, we're we're looking at seeing which one, which one of those we can apply for and which ones we can compete at. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Uh, congratulations to you seniors as well. It's hard to end on this note as well yeah. with the season as it is. Uh, so I really feel for you guys. It sounds like, Tyler, that we are ready to draw our giveaway winner. So if you could take that away. Yep. Once again, we'll draw for the Annie Mark Goat. Winner is going to be Evan S2410. Congratulations, Evan. Make sure you reach out to me so we can get that out to you. Once again, just a reminder, all suppliers are going to be a little bit delayed, but we do appreciate the supplier still stepping up and saying, hey, you know what? We can't do a whole lot right now, but we're still going to um, keep uh, giving out more giveaways uh, so people can win those. So thank you to companies like Animark and Rev and Analog Devices and others who have, who have been stepping up. But it really is appreciated. Thanks, Tyler. Unfortunately, that's uh, all we have time for tonight. Uh, thanks to everyone for hanging out with us. Fun needs your help to stay, li to stay loud, live, and independent. Please consider giving your support by joining Fun Nation with a subscription or bits on Twitch. Becoming a patron at patreon.com slash first updates now, or just letting people in first know that this is the place to be to get the information that your team needs. Don't forget to check us out on Discord, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and live on Twitch. On behalf of myself, Grace, and our producer, Tyler, I would like to thank you for tuning in and thank our moderators in chat. Best of the, ba Best of the West will be back in two weeks, but Fun will have shows every Monday and Tuesday and also be on the Twitch front page on Wednesday with an FTC reveal night, including 60 FTC robots. Make sure you check social and Discord to stay informed. Thank you, uh, thank you, 987, for coming on the show. Truly was a pleasure to talk to you guys today and talk to, you, talk to everyone in chat, talk to you guys... Wow, I can't talk. Talk to you <laughs> next time on Best of the West. All right. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.